Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight for Illinois Bone and Joint Institute's 47th Virtual YMCA Education Series Program with the North Suburban YMCA. My name is Karen Brownlee, and I am a personal trainer and the adult program coordinator at the NSYMCA in Northbrook, Illinois. This evening's presentation, entitled Spine Pain and Treatment, is being recorded so that you will be able to revisit it again. Please feel free to tell your friends and family about it so that they too can view it once it is posted on the IBJI and NSYMCA websites. Back pain is one of the most common medical problems in the United States. Symptoms of back pain can range from a muscle ache to a shooting, burning, stabbing, or tingling sensation. Whether acute or chronic, back pain impacts people's ability to work, play, and sometimes just manage the activities of their daily lives. This evening, we welcome William Mosenthal, MD, an Illinois Bone and Joint Institute board certified orthopedic surgeon with fellowship training in spine surgery to educate us about the treatment of bone, joint, and muscle conditions that affect the spine and back. Dr. Mosenthal specializes in neck, back, and spine care. He has expertise in computer navigated, robotic assisted, and minimally invasive spine surgery, as well as disc removal, cervical disc replacement, decompression, and fusion. He uses robust evidence-based treatment plans and procedures and is committed to patient-centered care and optimizing outcomes for spine-related conditions, injuries, and deformities. Reviews of Dr. Mosenthal all agree with this statement and sound much like what Vincent said about him in a September Google review. I really like this doctor. He takes his time to explain things so that you will understand what he's going to do. And he gives you options for you to decide what you want to do. I would recommend him to anyone who has a back problem. As a graduate of St. Lawrence University in Canton, New York, Dr. Mosenthal earned his Doctor of Medicine degree from the Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth in Hanover, New Hampshire. He then completed his orthopedic surgery residency at the University of Chicago Medical Center and went on to receive advanced subspecialty training in spine surgery through an exclusive year-long fellowship at Twin Cities Spine Center in Minneapolis. Dr. Mosenthal has offered, authored numerous peer-reviewed articles, reviews, books, chapters, and abstracts, and has presented his work at national meetings. His interests include developing standardized documentation for stronger evidence-based practices to help optimize patient outcomes. In addition, Dr. Mosenthal is passionate about improving the quality of spine-related information available to patients and creating a collaborative network of resources both surgical and non-surgical, available for patients in a centralized locale. Perhaps this program will one day end up in that information center. During Dr. Mosenthal's presentation this evening, you might find that you have questions for him, which he will be happy to address at the end of the program. Simply type your questions onto the question section on your screen and I'll receive them and relay them to Dr. Mosenthal immediately following his presentation. I do ask that you please keep your questions general as Dr. Mosenthal will not be able to address individual concerns without individual consultation. If you do have self-specific questions, easy for me to say, please contact Dr. Mosenthal via one of the options that will be listed on the slide shown during the question and answer portion at the end of his presentation. One last thing before I turn the evening over to Dr. Mosenthal. Please note that the IBJI YES program is taking the month of December off. Therefore, I invite you to join us again in 2024. Please mark your calendar for our next IBJI and YMCA Education Series program. On Tuesday, January 23rd at 7 p.m., Dr. Craig Malk will help us understand the options available for pain management. Thank you again for joining us tonight, and thank you, Dr. William Mosenthal, for your time and effort in putting together this program to help us better understand spine pain and treatment. Dr. Mosenthal, please take it from here. All right, thank you, Karen. Um, so good evening, everyone. Thanks for taking the time out um, to uh, let me run through this talk with you. Uh, today we'll be talking about um, low back pain and um, how we can best identify and treat the pain generators. All right, here we go. So the uh, plan for today's talk will be a brief introduction, um, and then we'll go through uh, the lumbar uh, spinal anatomy and how those anatomic structures can become pain generators. 
Um, and then we'll briefly go into the diagnosis and treatment of three common spinal conditions, disc herniations and spinal stenosis and degenerative spondylolisthesis. Um, and if we have a little time at the end, go into some of the more rare but interesting um, uh, lumbar cases and then wrap up with a brief uh, conclusion. And I'll make sure to leave plenty of time at the end to answer some of the questions that are sure to come up and that people have uh, sent in already today. So briefly, who am I? Um, Karen went above and beyond uh, in the introduction, so I'll skip that. But um, basically, I was born in France, moved to Vermont, grew up with three brothers, Vermont, the land of cheese and Ben and Jerry's, pretty leaves and maple syrup. Um, and then did uh, undergrad med school in the East Coast, uh, UChicago for residency, went up to Minneapolis for a spine fellowship. Um, and now back um, in Chicago, I've been with uh, Oak IBGI for uh, just over two years now. So uh, back pain can be a challenging uh, condition for both patients and uh, treating providers alike. Uh, this book written by Catherine Raymond is a, uh, she's an investigative uh, journalist who suffered um, chronic back pain and uh, decided to write a book on her experiences and the results and her kind of view on how we treat spine care in the United States is pretty damning, but not uh, totally um, uncalled for. Uh, she had this statement in the process of searching for better solutions. She exposed a much bigger problem, costing roughly 100 billion a year spine medicine, often ineffective and sometimes harmful, exemplified the worst aspects of the US healthcare system. So the back pain is very challenging and part of the reason for that is that you know back pain itself isn't a diagnosis it's it's uh, it's really a symptom and so unlike other parts of orthopedic care um, the diagnosis for back pain can be challenging at times so our first role uh, when meeting somebody with back pain is to rule out the red flag symptoms which this gentleman here is holding up on the edge of a cliff and what we mean by that are causes of back pain that need to be addressed on a more urgent basis. So those include uh, traumatic injuries like the fractures that you see here on the bottom left and upper right of your screen, malignancy, infection, and then one of the few but uh, extremely important kind of urgent spinal conditions to address, which is a cauda equina syndrome, which is um, stenosis or narrowing of the lumbar canal that is uh, so uh, intense that it basically disconnects the lumbar and sacral nerve roots from your ability to control your bowel and bladder. And so that's a surgical emergency. Now, those are extremely rare causes of back pain, but when we're doing our initial triage, that's one thing that you know we make sure to rule out. Other things that we always keep in the back of our mind is can this back pain be caused by something other than the spinal column? Things like um, aortic valve problems, kidney problems, things like that. So fortunately, the vast majority of back pain is not dangerous, um, but it is important to identify where the pain generator is because that helps us tailor the treatment a little more accurately. So for the next few slides, we're gonna be talking about the anatomy of the lumbar spine um, and various components of it and how it can be a source of pain. So the lumbar spine is made up of five lumbar vertebral bodies here. Um, in between the bones, you have the discs. Uh, this middle picture shows us the back of the spine. So you can see in the middle here, these spinous processes, these little outriggers, uh, or the transverse processes. And then on the image on the right, you can see this lumbar lordosis. So that uh, kind of curvature in your back is normal. Um, when you have a good lumbar support uh, in your chair, that's the uh, support that we're trying to give to the lumbar spine to help offload um, the spinal column itself. In between the bones, you have the discs. Uh, the discs are the shock absorbers. Uh, you can see the normal disc here on the top left, and then in the middle picture here, uh, an anatomical cross-section of a degenerated disc. Uh, you can think of the disc as a jelly donut, um, and so the bottom image shows us uh, the two components of the jelly donut. In the middle, you have the jelly, which is the nucleus, and then this tough fibrous outer uh, band called the annulus, or the pastry uh, part of the jelly donut. 
the disc herniations tend to occur when the nucleus leaks out through a crack in the annulus, um, as you see here on this MRI image at L5-S1 with this large um, black disc herniation entering the, the spinal canal. Now, everybody's discs are going to wear out as they get older. Uh, it's uh, one of the joys of aging. It's like gray hairs or wrinkles. And we know that people's MRIs, if you're over a certain age, are going to be abnormal. And they've done multiple studies on this. And this is one of my favorites. It's one of the early ones. Um, but basically, they took 100 people over the age of 40 that had no back pain or leg pain, put, in a, put them in an MRI scanner, and they found that about 90% of them had some form of problem with their discs, whether it was a black disc, a loss of disc height, a little disc protrusion there. So we have to be very careful in you know, correlating the patient's symptoms with what we see on the MRI. Um, you may have heard of the term degenerative disc disease. Um, I don't love that term because the word disease implies kind of a pathologic process or something that's dangerous. Um, and it's used all the time, even by you know radiologists and spine surgeons. Um, but I would argue that it's just part of the aging process. Yes, it can be you know painful. Um, it can result in an abnormal MRI, uh, but it's not a disease. Um, and so the hilarious joke that I use is that like gray hairs, wrinkles. Um, you wouldn't call somebody with wrinkles on their face and tell them that they have a degenerative face disease. So moving on to the backward part of the spine. So in the front, you have the bones and the discs. In the back of the spine, you have uh, these uh, pair of joints called the facet joints. They occur at every level. Um, it's that the joint surface uh, by which you're able to move uh, forward and backwards and a little bit laterally. And just like knee or hip arthritis, those can develop arthritis and be a source of pain. Um, on the image on the right, you can see um, these facet joints on one side, you've got the capsule. Those are the little white circles here. On the left side, you can see the joint with the capsule removed. And then just for orientation purposes, that dotted line here in the middle, those are overlying the spinous processes, the little bony prominences you can feel um, in the middle of your back. Now, if you look kind of forward on this image, you can see the bones and the discs that we talked about. And in between, you've got this hollow area or the spinal canal. And it's through the spinal canal that the nerves live. And so these yellow uh, things, those are the nerves. So your spinal cord starts um, all the way up at the junction of your occiput and the top of your cervical spine. And it descend, descends as one structure all the way down to about L1. And then at L1, the spinal cord kind of disappears and sends out these individual nerve rootlets uh, called the cauda equina. Um, the cauda equina is a Latin term for a horse's tail, um, and you can see that the, the description is relatively accurate with the horse's tail looking pretty similar to the individual nerve rootlets that you can see in this um, cadaveric cross section. Now these nerve rootlets will continue to descend, and then at each level you have a pair of nerves that exit through these individual tunnels called the foramen in between those facet joints and uh, the vertebral bodies. When um, somebody describes sciatica or kind of shooting leg pain, usually what we're dealing with is the irritation of one of these nerve roots. And then more superficially, you have uh, the muscles and the ligaments that make up your spine. And, you know, I would argue that this is uh, probably one of the more overlooked aspects of, of back pain, in part because there's no, you know, quick solution. Uh, for that, it doesn't tend to show up as abnormal on the MRI, except in extreme cases. But I think a large, you know, subset of uh, pain uh, can be related to um, injury to the muscles or ligaments. So uh, the images on the top left uh, show the superficial layer of the muscles in our back. Uh, the image on the bottom left shows us a cross section with these black areas um, outlined, showing that basically the muscles in the back are kind of a complex group of multiple muscles rather than one single muscle. And then we've got ligaments uh, that help support the bony structures. And so this middle image shows us the ligaments. And then today, together, the bones and the ligaments make up the kind of dynamic stabilizers that hold up our spine. And a good um, 
kind of analogy for this is one that I borrowed from Dr. Stuart McGill, who's a back biomechanic guru um, out of Waterloo, Canada, and I'd recommend if you have a really big interest in this, he's got a ton of resources, both books and online, that can kind of go in and describe, you know, basic spine anatomy, what happens when you injure your back, and ways to kind of self-treat it. But anyway, he talks about the spinal column as this, you know, radio tower, and then the muscles and ligaments um, as these guy wires that help support this tall structure. And basically he talks about needing not just a strong set of muscles and ligaments, um, but one that is flexible and stable. So it needs to have a little bit of give so it doesn't crack, um, but you know, not brittle that any type of force will, will cause it to break. So moving on to the next uh, part of our talk. So what do spine surgeons actually do? So if you, spine surgery is, uh, very complex field. There's about 200 ways to do any one thing, but at the end of the day, all surgical procedures serve to aim at least one goal. And the three goals are to decompress something that's compressed, to stabilize something that's unstable, and then to correct deformity. So examples of this would include somebody who has a disc herniation here pinching on the nerve. We can go in, decompress that nerve root by removing the disc. We can stabilize, in this case, a spondylolisthesis or a slippage of one bone on the other by performing a fusion. And not all stabilization surgeries need to be a fusion. So the image on the left is someone who has gone a successful anterior cervical discectomy and fusion. Uh, the middle image is an MRI sequence of somebody who's developed stenosis at the level adjacent to their fusion. And the image on the right is someone who's undergone a cervical disc replacement, so a non-fusion way to stabilize the spine. And then finally, we have the deformity corrections. Uh, these tend to be the scoliosis um, type surgeries, which I don't do a whole lot of anymore. They, they've migrated for the most part towards kind of these more uh, you know, specialized tertiary care systems. So moving on to uh, the first of the three common lumbar uh, spinal conditions, disc herniations. I think um, the image here is a very cool kind of cadaveric cross section of um, a disc herniation. So if you remember what we talked about with the jelly donut analogy, there's white stuff, that's the pastry or the annulus in the middle, that's the nucleus or the jelly. And you can see that it has migrated through a crack in the annulus and is pressing on the neural elements here in the middle. So disc herniations are extremely common. Um, about 10% of us will have a disc herniation at some point uh, in our lifetime that causes uh, symptoms. Uh, this tends to occur in the younger generation, so 40s and 50s, and the vast majority of them occur at the lower two levels at L4-5 and L5-S1. Um, they're one of the more common causes of sciatica. And when I say sciatica, I mean, uh, pain that radiates into your buttocks, thigh, calf, and into your foot. Um, it's technically upstream of the sciatic nerve. The sciatic nerve is the big nerve in the back of your thigh, which is formed up by the uh, lowermost lumbar nerve roots, um, but it tends to track in the sciatic nerve distribution, and that's why it's uh, gotten its name. The good news is that about 90% of folks who have those uh, symptoms are able to improve with non-operative treatment, uh, and usually within you know, the first three months. When a disc herniation occurs, um, it uh, will press on a nerve root, kind of depending on at which level that's occurring, and then where within that uh, segment it's occurred. So for example, this image shows a disc herniation at L4, L5. If it's a central disc herniation shown by the blue uh, circle here, that'll affect the traversing nerve root, which is an L5 nerve root problem. If that same disc herniation is a far lateral or extra foraminal disc, that'll affect the L4 nerve root. Um, to be honest, not a huge um, thing to be worried about. It's more important from a surgical standpoint if because we want to make sure that we're obviously decompressing the correct nerve root. And then the nomenclature of disc herniations can be very confusing. Um, and kind of like degenerative disc disease, which is still used, uh, even though it's not a disease, disc herniations um, 
have been used to describe various forms of disc bulging. And so there's been an attempt to standardize what makes a disc herniation. And in fact, we've tried to get rid of that term altogether. But briefly, um, a disc bulge is just a kind of circumferential bulging of the disc. And then these next three images will show various forms of what could be called a disc herniation. So this image here shows a disc protrusion which refers to uh, any disc material that has entered in the spinal canal um, that has a wider base than the length of what is into the spinal canal. A disc extrusion is the opposite, where the amount of disc material that has entered the canal is more than its base. And then the fourth image here, a disc sequestration is a disc fragment. Um, that is no longer in continuity with the disk space and has actually migrated um, away. So this image is uh, an MRI of someone with a large disk herniation at L4, L5, um, with the white arrow pointing right at the disk. And then if you remember, I said that about 90% of folks with a disc herniation and radiculopathy or sciatica tend to get better without surgery at three months, and this is a great example of it. And I tell you know, people that your body can identify this disc herniation as, as foreign and reabsorb it themselves. So this is the same young lady five months later who underwent physical therapy, a couple of injections, and you can see almost complete resolution of not just her symptoms, but of this disc herniation without any type of surgery. So when do we operate on these? Um, they tend to be reserved for kind of terrible leg pain that has persisted beyond a minimum of six weeks that have failed non-operative treatment and non-operative treatment involves activity modification, physical therapy exercises, and then various types of, of medications, muscle relaxers, anti-inflammatories, um, and then sometimes uh, an injection. Uh, reasons to operate on this more aggressively would be if you have progressive or significant weakness, or in the rare case of the Cauda Aquinas syndrome, which is uh, the surgical emergency I mentioned before, which is characterized by uh, extremely severe back and leg pain, saddle anesthesia, or numbness and tingling in your genital region, and then bowel or bladder incontinence. And so this is a um, both a plug for the difference between an open and minimally invasive microdiscectomy. A microdiscectomy is the procedure we would use to remove a disc. This is not my patient. This is taken from a paper, but I think it shows um, a good example of, of the benefits of, of minimally invasive surgery. So image C here shows a person who underwent an open discectomy with a large incision here marked by the black arrow. Unfortunately, she had a uh, re-herniation and so underwent uh, a second surgery uh, through a minimally invasive approach with a different surgeon shown here with the white arrow. And you can imagine the amount of tissue trauma between the large incision and the small incision is much less. So um, if you look at the image on the bottom right, uh, that shows an MRI of someone who has not had surgery with normal muscle bulk. The image on the bottom left here shows someone who underwent an open surgery and the amount of fatty infiltration and scar tissue shown by all this white infiltration of the otherwise black muscle, and then the image on the bottom right, somebody who's had a uh, microdiscectomy through a minimally invasive approach. And so what do I mean by minimally invasive? There's kind of two flavors of minimally invasive. There's the uh, arthroscopic one and then the tubular one. The difference between the two uh, are essentially the same. Uh, the tubular approach involves um, kind of a direct approach to the area of concern, so we are usually cheating it off to the side of the symptoms. Image A shows an x-ray with this um, uh, basically a sequential dilators docked on the back of the spinal canal. The sequential dilators are these colored tubes here. You can think of them as kind of rushing nesting dolls. You start out with a very small one, you dock on the area of concern, and then you sequentially dilate over the top, spreading the muscle out to the side rather than um, you know, reflecting it off the bone. And then image C shows us the setup um, intra-op with the rigid arm attached to the bed and then the tube into the spine. And then this is what it looks like uh, through the tube. So obviously the downside from a surgical standpoint is you know, your vision is much limited. So these are done through either loop magnification or with the help of a microscope. And so this image A is the disc fragment that's being teased out of the spinal canal. And then image B shows us the nice 
uh, decompressed nerve root here, which is this white uh, tubular structure. And so this is a, a case of mine, a uh, young lady who came in with not just uh, severe leg pain, but uh, almost complete inability to dorsiflex or cock up her ankle. Um, and this was due to the large uh, disc protrusion here. And then you can see this disc kind of extrusion um, here marked by the blue line. And so we went in and through a minimally invasive approach, removed the disc. This is what a large disc uh, herniation looks like once it's been removed. And she had near complete resolution of her pain in the recovery area. Strength, which always lags behind, um, was nearly completely restored by the, by the six week mark. So our second spinal condition is spinal stenosis. And so spinal stenosis is the most common cause of lumbar spine surgery in folks over the age of 65. And stenosis just means narrowing of the spinal canal. And so this spinal stenosis tends to be more of a circumferential uh, narrowing versus the disc herniations we just talked about. And this occurs slowly over the course of years. Uh, due to a combination of kind of disc bulging here in the front and then bone spurs and hypertrophy of the ligament uh, that hold the joint here in the back. So the image here with that says no stenosis, demonstrate a happy spinal canal with a happy nerve sac. The nerve sac is this white um, tubular structure here in the middle. You can think of it as a, a water balloon with the white signal here being the spinal fluid and then these little black dots being the nerves. And then the image on the bottom right, uh, you can see pinching from either side here in the back and in the front and the spinal or um, dural sac, if you will, being just this gray structure here in the middle. So folks with spinal stenosis uh, tend to have back pain, but their primarily concern is with the back and thigh and calf pain that they get when they stand and walk. They find that when they sit down, the pain tends to get better pretty quickly. When they're out walking, uh, they find that they can walk farther when they're hunched forward. Because when you hunch forward, you're opening up the spinal canal, which makes more room for the nerves. And so you can see this image here of uh, someone on the shopping cart. There's a, a thing called the shopping cart sign. It's described in our textbooks. And people find that they can walk much farther and with less pain when they're leaning forward um, on the shopping cart. And so it's important, like any of these conditions, to rule out other mimickers, um, things like hip arthritis or poor blood flow can uh, mimic uh, some of these conditions. So that's why we don't make you know, treatment decisions based on the MRI alone. Um, it speaks to kind of the importance of the physical exam and, and history. And so the treatment, surgical treatment for spinal stenosis is a laminectomy. Um, the image on the left shows the yellow nerves here in the front. Um, and you can imagine that overgrowth of the facets here on the sides and the disc bulge here, which is not shown, can contribute to pinching. And so we go in from the back and trim out the ligament. Um, this is a keros, this silver instrument is a kerosene rongeur. It's kind of a punch press uh, that we use to safely remove any bone spurs. And then the image on the right shows a schematic of uh, what a laminectomy would look like. So this uh, rectangle here shows um, a two-level um, laminectomy. So basically kind of just unroofing of the back of the spinal canal while making sure to keep enough bone to prevent any type of instability. So the third condition is a degenerative uh, spondylolisthesis. And so spondylolisthesis refers to a slippage of one bone um, on the other. And so you can see that here on this x-ray with kind of a staircase configuration. If I drive up the back of L5, I have to scooch forward to get to the back of L4, whereas L3 here is in perfect alignment with L4. There's kind of two flavors of spondylolisthesis. There's the degenerative ones, um, which tend to occur just due to arthritic type changes, and then an isthmic spondylolisthesis, which uh, tends to show up either in the younger kind of teenage athletic population or years later, um, and it refers to a slippage that has occurred due to a fracture uh, through the pars, which is one of the bony um, elements that make up the back of the spinal canal. And so the uh, symptoms of that, there can be an axial back pain uh, component, meaning you know pain localized just to the low back. Some people 
uh, can feel the sensation of the one bone slipping on the other. There's this uh, term called a catch instability, where if they go from you know forward flexion to extension, they'll have to kind of stop suddenly because they get a jolt of pain and then they can resume. And I had a lady just last week who had an audible. So when she would do that, not only would she have pain, but you could hear the clunking back and back and forth. Um, so it, Sometimes cannot it can be not subtle. Um, again, not a dangerous condition, just tends to fall under the um, arthritic spectrum. And then we do know that when you have a slip there, you're a little more likely to have kind of stenosis. So some people will have um, radicular uh, or pain radiating down into their legs in addition to this back pain. And so usually surgery involves some form of spinal decompression and in a lot of cases a fusion just to prevent any worsening of that existing um, instability. And so this is a, an example of someone who is a anterolisthesis or a forward slippage of L4 on L5 um, with reduction and a posterior instrument infusion which refers to pedicle screws and rods in L4 and L5 and sometimes we will in certain cases use an anterior column support um, in the form of an inner body um, implant here between the vertebral bodies where the disc used to be. So let me look at the time, it's 7.30. I wanna to get to people's questions, so I'll kind of breeze over um, this portion of the talk, but robotics and navigation, um, are a big buzzword, not just in spine surgery, but in, in a lot of surgical specialties uh, for a variety of reasons that we'll talk about briefly. Um, the first uh, iteration um, occurred in 1985, um, actually for a neurosurgical application of a bi brain biopsy. And then the image on the right shows the da Vinci robot, uh, which has been probably the most successful uh, introduction of robotics into surgery. They've kind of re, they've kind of changed the gold standard for, um, hysterectomies and uh, prost prostatectomies um, just because they're able to get to difficult to reach places in a less traumatic manner. And so the benefits of robotic surgery, you know, for ob and urology are similar to what we've found in spine surgery, meaning we're able to use it through a more minimally invasive approach, which means smaller scars, quicker recovery time, shorter hospitalizations, less blood loss, less pain. And so what makes up a navigation or robotic platform? Um, we need an ability to image the spine three-dimensionally intraop, which is this big donut looking thing here. Um, and we need to be able to communicate uh, from the uh, surgical instrument standpoint to the robotic system, which we do through these two monitors here and then these eyes, which will tell us where the instrument and the patient is in space. Um, navigation and robotics is, tend to be used uh, interchangeably. Um, I think robotics is, I think of it as a subset of navigation. The only difference is um, Robotics uh, uses a rigid arm, like you can see here on the top right. So this is a surgeon placing a pedicle screw through a tube. That robotic arm has been positioned based on where you've templated the screw to go in. And once you've set it, um, you're just going through that tube. There's no wiggle room. Navigation allows the surgeon to kind of make uh, minute changes in real time. And so that's the image here in the middle. You can see the eyes um, on the uh, screwdriver, as well as uh, the array that has been affixed to the patient. So that allows the computer to know where the patient is, where the surgeon's instrument is. And you can see that the patient's eyes here are not on the patient, but actually up on this screen as they um, attempt to place the, the pedicle screw. And so is this a cool solution looking for a problem? I would argue no, it's actually um, a solution to a problem that you know, has existed since we started placing um, implants into the spine, meaning not all surgeons are gonna place the implants in the correct position 100% of the time. And when they go in the wrong position, you can have catastrophic outcomes like screws here in the aorta. Again, these are again, very rare complications, but they're real and they do occur. And they've done studies showing um, much safer and more accurate screw placement with the use of navigation and robotics. The second is radiation safety. So there's much less radiation um, used when placing pedicle screws via a minimally invasive approach. 
when you're using navigation or robotics versus uh, kind of fluoroscopic guidance. And then planning. So we're allowed to place our screws exactly where we want, um, which allows for safe screw placement through small pedicles, which is the image here on the bottom left. And then when you're doing these longer constructs, you can place the screws in such a way to allow for easier rod uh, placement. And then um, I mentioned that it facilitates minimally invasive surgery. This is a person who has you know, butt and leg pain in the classic um, kind of lumbar radiculopathy pattern. An MRI which shows severe stenosis at L3-4, L4-5, and L5-S1. And then the post-surgical changes of an L3 to S1, uh, posterior and inner body uh, instrumented fusion. And then you can, you can create a construct like that uh, through three small um, incisions. So, so in conclusion, um, back pain is a symptom, not a diagnosis. Um, it's very important to identify the pain generator to help um, guide effective treatment. Um, we obviously pay close attention to um, catch the red flag diagnoses early on, um, but hopefully you can be reassured that while back pain is very common and can be very debilitating. It is very rare that it's a sign of a serious problem and that it does tend to get better um, without surgical treatment in almost all cases. So I will pause here. Um, and so I'm gonna just address some of the questions that have been sent to me and then I'll open it up um, to the group. <clears throat> All right, so uh, the first question is, can spinal stenosis cause severe continuing pain in the hip and top side of the rump? What surgical procedures can be used to cure this situation and, and how risky is it? So um, spinal stenosis can cause pain in the hip and um, kind of buttocks area. Um, and if you remember, actually, I mentioned that one of the things we have to rule out um, in spinal stenosis situations is uh, arthritis of the hip. Um, but yes, the symptoms uh, described there can definitely be related to spinal stenosis. What surgical procedures can be used uh, to cure the situation? So if the pain is debilitating, it's been going on for months, you've tried all sorts of non-surgical treatment options like injections, PT, then surgery would be an option. Um, the surgery would usually involve some form of a decompression, usually a laminectomy, and then if it's in the setting of instability, respond to thesis may be a fusion, but most of these are able to get better, be made better with a decompression. Um, the recovery is you're up walking the same day. If it's a, if you're healthy and it's a single, maybe two level problem, you're potentially, you know, it's an outpatient procedure. You're home later that day. How risky is it? Um, there's risks involved with any surgery. Um, I'd say without going through the laundry list of, of complications, I would say the, you know, one of the more common ones um, would be a spinal fluid leak, which is about five to 7%. It's not the end of the world, it's repaired primarily. Uh, you, might, you might keep you overnight in the hospital, flat on your back. Um, the other ones um, are all kind of in the one to 2% range, things like bleeding and infection, um, things like that. But, uh, you know, spinal stenosis surgery is one of the, surgeries with the longest track record and have uh, excellent outcomes um, on the whole. The next question, is there uh, relief possible for osteoporosis, especially after a fall? So osteoporosis uh, refers to uh, softer bones or, or weaker bones. Uh, they uh, it tends to occur um, as we get older, uh, more common in females than males is diagnosed with a DEXA scan. Unfortunately, there are um, multiple uh, types of bisphosphonates or bone building medications in addition to the calcium and vitamin D. Osteoporosis puts you at a higher risk of what we call fragility fractures or fractures that occur due to weakened bones and in the spine world, compression fractures um, are one of the more common ones we see in a compression fracture. Um, I think I have a picture of it here. Uh, actually, that's more of a high energy burst fracture, but basically it involves kind of pancaking of the bone from one rectangle to kind of a, a bow tie shape. Um, at one year, it doesn't matter whether we've put cement in the bone, treated you in a brace, 
just treated you with um, activity modification um, at one year, the outcomes are the same. Um, so yes, there is relief possible for kind of osteoporotic uh, related uh, pain, but um, when we see folks with compression fractures due to osteoporosis, I make sure to that they've had a DEXA scan and that they're on some form of bone building medication to help you know, prevent kind of subsequent fractures or a uh, hip fracture, which is a life-changing event and also happens when, when you have weaker bones. Next question, when an epidural um, injection is effective at relieving pain, is it only masking the pain? Um, that's a good question. I would say it's not gonna mask the pain to the point where you do something dangerous to yourself. Um, it's not gonna make the spinal canal any bigger. So it's not treating the root cause, um, but it is decreasing the inflammation on the nerves. And so decreased inflammation on the nerves can make you feel better. Um, so it can be an effective treatment option. And when you're looking at surgery, you know, folks who get an injection once or twice a year are you and get many months of relief are able to do what they need to do. Um, I would say, you know, I would continue to do that because that might be all you need. And the risk profile of an injection is much less than, than a surgery. So um, I think it's an important part in, in the treatment of, uh, you know, many spinal conditions, not just stenosis. And then the last question that I have here, um, it's a long question, so I'm going to kind of summarize it, but it's somebody who has sciatic pain, so pain radiating into the legs. Their MRI shows a synovial cyst, which is something we have not talked about, um, but it's, it refers to um, a uh, kind of a fluid collection or pocket that comes out through one of these facet joints here. Um, if you've ever heard of a baker cyst in a knee, it's a similar process, but these are extremely painful. Um, they, the treatment is, again, if there's no weakness, the treatment algorithm is very similar to what we've described in the past. Um, these can be finicky in that an injection can help decrease inflammation temporarily. We can sometimes pop uh, the cyst with the needle, um, but they do have a tendency to recur. So if you know, the injections don't work if the physical therapy isn't providing longstanding relief, um, you know, surgery to remove the cyst. And if it's in the setting of instability, maybe, you know, a fusion uh, would be a reasonable thing to try. If there's not a big slip, we usually just start with a synovial cyst uh, resection. Um, and the pain relief, especially if it's leg pain more than back pain, can be pretty immediate. So uh, repeat steroid injections aren't dangerous. Um, and then uh, surgery, would it be curative and how dangerous would it be? Again, it's a little hard to know without having examined you or checked the, the imaging, but um, if it's leg pain predominant symptoms and that synovial cyst is impacting the nerve that is in the distribution where your pain is, uh, the outcomes are, are very successful. All right, sorry, I feel like I've been blabbering. Karen, do you have any questions that have popped up on your end? Uh, and no, don't, no need to apologize. You have not been blabbering. It's been helpful, and it, we appreciate you addressing those questions because they are really, uh, you know, that's what people come here, right? They want to learn from you and get their questions answered. So thank you. Um, okay. So by the way, congratulations, it's had a new baby. Thank you. Yes. No, I got to update the image because he's just over a year now. So. Oh yay! Well, that's my wonderful. first one. So counts as new. Awesome. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. So. Um, someone says they've been seeing a doctor for pain, got an MRI, and the doctor said that um, the MRI indicated that they needed surgery. Then they got a second opinion, and the second doc said that they don't need surgery. He says, now, who do I believe? Uh, so uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so again, I'm going to just put up this slide. It's not mucking with the slides, but it, it's, so unlike, again, you know, somebody who has end-stage hip arthritis, you can make the diagnosis at the door, you put 10 surgeons in the room, they're all gonna recommend the same thing. That's not always the case uh, with spine. Um, and so I would say it's understandably frustrating. I would, especially if, if you've tried all these non-surgical options, the pain's severe and you need something to be done, I would recommend probably a third opinion, almost as a tie, you know, a tie breaker. Um, 
because you know the MRI analysis alone, it would be hard pressed to make a treatment decision based on that. You really need kind of a physical exam and then the history uh, taking. So I would say it's not uncommon to get kind of conflicting views um, in spine world. And so I think maybe getting a third kind of tiebreaker opinion uh, would be a, a good next step. Makes sense, makes sense. Um, someone else asks, can hip pain be the result of a spine issue? You've already talked about that a little bit, um, but I'll let you just go ahead and sort of answer directly. Uh, yeah, sorry, is it, was it back pain caused hip pain or the other way around? Can, can hip pain, pain be the result of a spine issue? Can hip pain be the result of a spine issue? Yeah, I would say yes, um, just because you know any alter so we've been walking you know the same way for years any alteration in your gait whether it's you sprained your ankle and you were placed in a boot or back pain and you're favoring one side you kind of change the stresses that you've put on your joints um and so you know leg pain can cause back pain and back pain can cause can cause hip pain yes got it okay thank you all right um this person asks what's your opinion on wearing a back brace to help improve movement reduce nerve inf inflammation um and then it says so can do traction to make room in disc so I, I guess the question is what is your opinion on wearing a back brace to help improve yeah. movement and reduce nerve inflammation yeah so there's uh you know back braces are a little controversial um and there's a wide variety of back braces out there there's the kind of elastic ones that um help provide minimal stability but can give that sense of kind of security from the compression and keep things um, a little bit warmer there's the lso braces which have a rigid back which we'll use for compression fracture treatment or post-surgical in some cases and then there's the kind of weight building type braces that weightlifters will use and then sometimes people in uh, professions with a lot of heavy lifting will use uh, my thought on back braces is that they can be helpful in post-surgical and fracture treatment. I think they can be a, a bit of a double-edged sword in the treatment of back pain, just because back braces will help the muscles out, allow the muscles to have to do less work. So long-term treatment can make the muscles weaker and give you more problems down the line. Now, there's also these posture braces, which to be honest, I don't think there's a lot of data about. Um, so if it's one of those, it's probably one of those unlikely to harm can only help things. But if it's one that has any type of rigidity, I would really try to reserve it for episodes where you're gonna have to do a lot of heavy or repetitive lifting, or if it's one activity that you know is going to um, hurt your back. Uh, but I would caution against using it kind of multiple hours a day, kind of long-term. I think the quest, second question was regarding traction. So traction, uh, the idea behind that is to try to help kind of distract um, the spinal segments apart, make more room for the nerves. And so inversion tables are kind of the ones that people most commonly have heard of. Um, I think can be good for acute flare-ups. Um, again, the data behind it uh it tends to show that it's it tends to be on the temporary end of things but if it's the end of a long work day it hurts you get on the inversion table or you hang from a pull-up bar or somebody can provide traction for you um i think it's a a low risk you know potentially high reward thing great thank you um and, and someone asks if you operate robotically the answer is yes right you mm -hmm. and, and, do yeah, you and do again robotics will be you know primarily at Again, I think the future, there's, there's, I'm very excited to see what the future brings. So robotics, we only use when we have to do a fusion. So when we're using instrumentation, if it's just a decompression, whether it's a microdiscectomy or a laminectomy, that's used. Nobody uses the, um, well, I don't want to say nobody. I, there's, in my mind, no need to use uh, robotics for that. Gotcha. Um, you've already answered the question about how dangerous the surgeries are to correct the spine. So. You know, you've already mentioned that. Is there anything more you'd like to say about that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, part of the reason we use robotics is to help mitigate the risk of complications. Same thing with the minimally invasive approach. And, you know, we've come a long way, even in my, you know, um, relatively short career. Um, but all surgery, 
you know, carries with it some risks. And so you could do 100 micro discs, patient's leg pain gets better within the first week, they're all outpatients, but that doesn't mean something bad can happen. Um, you know, if you look at Steve Kerr, the coach of the Golden State Warriors, he had what sounds like a microdiscectomy, spinal fluid leak that had, they had a hard time getting under control. And so what turned out to be one of our more successful easy, lower risk profile surgeries, you had a whole host of complications after the fact. So that's why I'm a big proponent and sometimes maybe to a fault that, you know, you can't undo surgery and that almost anything you can consider is gonna carry with it a lower risk profile um, than surgery. That being said, I think the risk profile of the procedures we do now is much less than it was 10, 20 years ago, uh, which is very, very encouraging. Um, and then when you're looking at the types of procedures, you know, the fusion surgeries tend to have a slightly higher risk profile than the decompression alone, but you know, every year we're learning more and finding ways to mitigate the, the risk, so. Okay, great, thank you, that's very helpful. Um, someone said they had, um, two years ago, they had an L4, L5, L5 laminectomy infusion. Since then, they've had some major pain that moves around in their back and legs and continues even with repeated physical therapy and injections and acupuncture. They're, so they're wondering, you know, what do I do now? So if you've got someone who's, you know, to, is there corrective surgery for this? What do you do now? Yeah, so we would, so they so there's kind of a lot of nuance to that question. You know, one the first question I would have would be, okay, was this back pain, leg pain, was it ever better after the surgery? Like, did you have a period of time where you had really good relief and then unfortunately the symptoms crept back? If that's the case, then, you know, maybe we're dealing with a pseudarthrosis, which is um, a non-fusion um, at that level. Um, if that's, if you never got better, then you're looking, okay, you know, was there um was the decompression done adequately are the implants in the safe area if so okay could there be a stenosis at a level above or below that we haven't addressed or could this be one of the back pain you know mimickers or a pinched nerve outside of the back so um i would say don't don't give up hope by any means um you know there's lots of possibilities that can be addressed again not all those possibilities need surgery right off the bat. Um, but the big question for me would be, was there a period of time where you had pretty good symptom relief and it returned? Or, you know, once you got done with that surgical pain, the symptoms were pretty similar. And I think that would be kind of the important branch point for me. Awesome, that's, that's a really helpful answer, thank you. Um, if someone has weak bones, uh, and I'm thinking they're osteoporotic, um, can they still have surgery or fusion? Um, it's a great question, and the answer yeah. is yes. Um, there's different things we can do to help uh, address the challenge of osteoporosis. So the reason we care so much about osteoporosis and fusions is that osteoporosis refers to weak bones. Weak bones have a harder time keeping hold of the implants, if you will. So if like I can go up to hang up a picture on the wall, I want to find, I want to put the nail in a stud the wood you know, support behind the wall rather than in between because it's more likely to hold the weight that I'm gonna put on, on the screw or the nail. And so we can use you know, the biggest screws possible. We can sometimes inject cement through uh, the tip of the screw, which acts as uh, kind of additional support to help prevent uh, pullout strength. And then you know, depending on how bad the osteoporosis and the pain is, sometimes we wait a period of time if you haven't been on any bone building medication to start the medication and, and help the bones get a little bit stronger before undergoing surgery. So yes, there's different kind of uh, surgical and kind of preoperative uh, things we can try to help minimize the risk of, of a fusion surgery. Okay, thank you. Um... That's very helpful because that's a question I think a lot of people have, you know, who are osteoporotic. So thank you. Um, okay, uh, that one's a little personal. Um, could you briefly discuss non-surgical procedures such as radio frequency nerve ablation and, and endoscopic? Uh, you can maybe help me out on spelling it or saying it. R h i z o t o m y. Okay, rhizotomy. Yeah. So let me. I'm gonna go to my. So that those treatments are typically used for pain coming from the facet joints. Okay. So those facet joints are the knuckle-shaped joints that you have at each level. It's what allows you to bend 
um, in either direction. And when you crack your back, that's usually what you're cracking. And when those joints get arthritic, they can get uh, painful. And so for something to be painful, there has to be a communication between the thing causing pain and your brain, because your brain is ultimately mm -hmm. what processes the pain. And so what's not shown on this diagram is that these facet joints have little microscopic nerve endings on them. Okay. And those allow us to kind of help us sense where our body is in space, but they can become a pain, a source of pain if the joint that it supplies the nerve supply to is arthritic. So what the pain management docs will do, will inject that joint. If you get good relief, then they can go on and do the uh, ablation or rhizotomies, which serve to kind of disconnect the circuitry from these facet joints to the brain. And so these are not the main joints that we were talking about below. They're kind of these little microscopic right. ones. You can lose them without uh, much downstream effect. And sorry, what was the what was the question again? So um, just could you briefly discuss those not those procedures? Yeah, so they're, they're basically targeting the facet joints. Um, they have good and kind of sometimes longer term uh, success than the injections just because it takes a while for those little microscopic nerves to grow back. But the first step in the spirit of, you know, identifying the pain generator to guide treatment is to prove that these facet joints are the source of pain. And the best way to do that is to inject those joints and you go back to your normal activities. And if you get good relief, we've proven that that's the pain generator. And then you can undergo the ablation rhizotomy. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, can you address the difference between SI joint pain versus sacroiliac pain? Is that really your specialty or is that more a hip person? No, that's well, that's, that's kind of we're getting towards the hip, but no, we, I treat SI joint yeah. pain. Um, so they were asking to differentiate SI joint. SI joint pain versus sacroiliac pain. Okay, so to be honest, in my, in, so SI joint, refers to the sacroiliac the joint sacroiliac joint right where the sacrum meets the pelvis i don't think i have a good picture of that but it's basically if you look down here at the sacrum these little wings here off to the side um that's the sacral side of the si joint those the kind of bony thing that you can feel on the top of your pelvis here that's the iliac wing and that wraps around and joins um, the sacrum. And so that gap in between, that's the SI joint. Um, that can be a, a source of pain and often an overlooked one. Uh, but in my world, I would say that an SI joint, you know, dysfunction or pain is similar to sacroiliac um, joint pain. So they're, they're, yeah, that makes sense. And in my world too, um, as a trainer, that's, that's what I was thinking is it's really more hip um, thank you. Okay, so hopefully that helped answer the question. Um, someone asks, what does it mean when you are told you have a floating disc? A floating disc? I was I was wondering, maybe that's when you said how it, you know, how that part separates off and it, maybe that's the floating disc? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I don't know. That's a very nice way of uh, calling what we call it sequestration here. Um, but yeah, I haven't heard that term. Um, okay. Yeah, I think that's a good a good guess. Maybe they're referring to this okay. disc sequestration. Yeah, could be. Okay. Um, uh, la, 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 la. Let's see. I'm I'm trying to read through. I you know as you're answering, I want to listen to you and not read the next questions. So I apologize. We're getting a bunch of thank yous. Um, uh -huh. So thank you for the great information. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay. Some of these um, are there side effects that could be dangerous from injections? Um, yeah, you, any, you know, any type of uh, time you break the skin, there's the theoretical risk of bleeding and infection. Um, if you're a diabetic, um, it can raise your blood sugars. Mm -hmm. In very rare cases, it can cause bleeding inside the spinal canal or, or a dural you know, puncture. Um, again, the risk profile of an injection though is much less than any you know, type of surgical intervention, even the you know, the least invasive microdiscectomy. So it's not without risks, but it's usually a very well tolerated procedure. Great, thank you. Um, and this was a, a question that uh, I don't think you addressed. What pain medications would you recommend to people? Yeah, so that's a uh, good question. Again, kind of a case by case basis. Um, at the beginning, it's 
over-the-counter anti-inflammatories. And again, I say case-by-case -case basis because if you have kidney problems, ulcers, maybe NSAIDs aren't the best thing for you. If you're on blood thinners, we stay away from the NSAIDs. If you have liver problems, we stay away from Tylenol. So I'll speak kind of globally, but first-line treatment would be non-steroidals, things like ibuprofen, Aleve, naproxen, and then Tylenol or acetaminophen. Those worked in two different ways. Then topical anti-inflammatories like Voltaren gel or lidocaine patches. Um, next up would be uh, prednisone, which is a, a steroid. Um, and then muscle relaxers can be helpful, particularly with nighttime symptoms. Um, for neuropathic pain, so numbness, tingling, burning, altered sensation, uh, medications like gabapentin uh, can help target that. And then we really reserve opiate pain medication for, I don't have to go into kind of why, um, but uh, in my practice, opiates are basically in the post-operative period and we try to wean you off it as quickly as possible. And then if you have a fracture uh, in the short term, we'll use those. But um, the use of opiates for back and leg pain is really kind of fallen by the wayside because of the risks, also because they've shown that it can cause more problems from a pain recovery standpoint. Oh. Um, so it's really reserved for if you go to the emergency department, the pain's so bad, you know, they'll give you a few to kind of get you by the next 48, 72 hours, but uh, they don't play a huge role in our, at least in my treatment of it. Gotcha. All right. I'm sorry we have bumped past eight o'clock and I told you, Dr. Mosenthal, that we'd get you out of here by eight, but it is 8.01. So that's, thank that's you. Not bad and no problem. Are there any burning uh, additional uh, questions? We can... You know, there are there are a lot of additional questions. So thank you everyone for all of your questions. Um, you know, we could probably be here till 10 o'clock tonight, and I don't think that's fair to you, especially with a one-year-old at home. So um, uh, everyone, you can see Dr. Mosenthal's information on the screen here. You can um, make an appointment with him and see him. You know, especially uh, if you don't live too far from there. But um, Dr. Mosenthal, thank you. You gave a great amount of information, but in very understandable terms, and we all really appreciate that. So thank you for your time. Thank you all of you for being with us tonight. Um, have a great evening, and um, maybe we'll see you again, Dr. Mosenthal, down the road sometime. Yeah, no, this was fun. Happy to, happy to do it again. Thanks, everyone. Awesome. Thank you. Take care. Have a great night.